once again welcome to the webinar and we are good to go so welcome everybody to today's webinar we are very pleased to have all of you here and we are happy to get started in today's webinar ISIS the International Solar Energy Society is happy to welcome the IEA HSG Solar Academy once again to present on the topic of solar heating and cooling markets trends and outlooks my name is Arabella. I am the Congress's Communications and Outreach Officer here at ISIS HQ, and I will give you a short introduction into ISIS and the work we do, as we have many new participants joining us on the webinar today. So, ISIS, who are we? ISIS is a UN accredited nonprofit NGO founded in 1954, and we've been accredited since 1992. ISIS represents a diverse membership of academics, researchers, energy practitioners, consultants, students, businesses and advocates from countries all around the world. Our vision is 100% renewable energy for all, used efficiently and wisely. And ISIS works together with like-minded organizations such as the SHC from countries all around the world to advance the renewable energy transformation. To achieve this, we have a few key activities which I'd like to introduce to you shortly. We have biannual congresses. Those are, for example, the ISIS Solar World Congress 2023, which is coming up this year. And next year, we will be having Eurosun 2024. We have two key publications, which is Solar Energy and Solar Energy Advances. We hold webinars, such as the one today, and we have education initiatives for young researchers, both online and offline. And additionally, we also publish a series of infographics and that's something exciting that's going to be relaunching this year. We have an actual virtual solar energy museum that's also coming up towards the end of this year. Now for the webinar today, which is why we're here, we will be hearing from our three presenters and we will have a cumulative Q&A session at the very end of the webinar. This is where you can submit your questions to the speakers. You don't have to wait until the very end. You can already start typing in your questions in the chat box. Um, feel free to send them at any time throughout the webinar, but please keep in mind, keep the questions short and precise and write who the question is for. So we will have an easier time allocating questions to speakers when we do the Q&A session. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce you to the moderator of today, Pedro Diaz. Pedro is passionate a passionate advocate for the decarbonization of heating and cooling systems, especially since he joined Solar Heat Europe back in 2008. As the former Secretary General and current Policy Director at Solar Heat Europe, he's been de devoted to advancing the potential of solar thermal energy in Europe. So, Pedro, a warm welcome from our side, and I'm handing over to you. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction, Annabelle, and, and thanks also to IEA, SHC, and ISIS for the opportunity to cooperate with this webinar once again uh, as a moderator. So, um, my name is Pedro Diaz, as Annabelle was saying. I work for Solid Europe, a trade association representing the solid and cooling sector in, in, in Europe. Uh, I'm rather enthusiastic about the topic of our webinar today and uh, the fact that we have three outstanding uh, speakers. Uh, Werner Weiss, Berbel Epp, and, and Nicholas uh, Gradlin. Um, as you know, the webinar is foreseen to take uh, around one hour and a half with the Q&A part at the end, as Arabella was just explaining. Without uh, further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce our first speaker that will start with an introduction about the IA SHC uh, uh, and its Solar Academy. Uh, and then proceed for the main presentation on the new edition of Solar Heat of Light. So the speaker is Werner Weiss. Werner is one of the most reputed uh, experts in our sector. Um, it has been uh, uh, for me a pleasure to, to work with Werner uh, over the years uh, within Solar Heat Europe and the different spaces we work also on research and innovation topics. Um, and um, also uh, for all the experience that the Werner is bring, uh, brings uh, over all these years. So he's a founding member and the director of Austrian Research Institute, AIM Tech in, in Gleisdorf, uh, and he's working in national and international solar thermal and energy efficiency projects since the beginning of the 80s. Uh, as, as you might know, uh, Werner is also uh, a co-author of the study Solar Heat Worldwide, that will be uh, presented today. So, Werner, thank you very much once again, and the floor is yours. 
Yeah, thank you, Pedro, for the introduction. And as it was mentioned already, uh, I will have two presentations. One is just short on the Solar Academy webinar series. Um, as you might know, the IEA Solar Heating and Cooling Program uh, organizes together with ISIS, was just explained by Arabella before, this uh, quarterly webinars. Our webinar today is on solar heating and cooling markets, trends and outlook. And it's presented today and in two days in the morning for the Eastern Hemisphere. As you can see at the solar heating and cooling, so I hope you can see my, my slide. Um, IEA Solar Heating and Cooling is a R&D &D collaboration already since the 70s. We have 19 member countries and eight international uh, partners. And also the European Commission is partner of the IEA Solar Heating and Cooling Program. Currently, more than 200 experts worldwide are working in our nine current tasks. Tasks are basically research projects uh, where we are working in. And just to mention a few of them, uh, we work on solar process heat, on solar cooling, on solar energy in buildings, but also on, on thermal storages and solar district heating uh, and integrated lighting. Uh, so these are a very broad range of different projects we are working in. So if you're interested to joining one of the solar heating and cooling tasks, then please check uh, on our website uh, if your country is member of the IEA Solar Heating and Cooling Program, um, then you see also organization members if you fall in with this, within this. And here I should also mention also all ISIS. ISIS is a member of SHC, so uh, also there is a possibility to join tasks um, if you are an ISIS member. Then learn more about tasks. If you want, just visit our website. And if you are really interested to join a task as an expert, please contact our task managers. But you will also find a link on our website. So what is the Solar Heating and Cooling Academy? It's basically, we had the idea several years ago, all the uh, research results we produce from more than 50 years uh, international collaboration to distribute this information to as many people as possible. So therefore, we have these scientific results, but also training materials, case studies, fact sheets, databases, design and evaluation assessment tools. This is what we transfer to a bright, uh, broad audience worldwide. Uh, what we offer, it's more than just the, the webinars. It's the webinars I meant already, mentioned already. Uh, then I want to mention also the next webinar will be on 19th and 21st of September. The topic will be solar energy in buildings. So if you're interested, join this webinar as well. Then we also have videos. You can find all these videos also on our YouTube channel. And we have on-site training. So if there is interest in a certain region or country, if you do not participate in the task, there is the possibility that experts of IA, SHC, go to this country and do an on-site training. If you're interested in this, you can also get in uh, contact with our secretariat. You can see the email address on the bottom of this slide. So you find more information on our website, I mentioned it several times, uh, you can download the solar heating and cooling publications. For instance, the solar heat worldwide report, which I will present in a minute, and you can follow us on social media. So with this, um, just the final slide. It's our flagship report. It's the solar heat worldwide report, uh, which uh, is, uh, yeah prepared by a colleague of mine, Monica sperg and myself. So we do it now for 19 years already on an annual basis, and we have a semi-annual newsletter. This is 
what you get for free download so just go on our website with this uh, thank you for your attention for this short overview on the ia solar heating and cooling uh, academy and now i want to switch over to the to my presentation or the main presentation the solar heat worldwide i guess most of you uh, know it already solar heat worldwide uh, presents every year the development on solar heating and cooling worldwide uh, we have currently more than 70 countries where we have detailed information on the market development in the last year so we have the for most of the or a lot of the countries we have the detailed information already for 2022 and in this report you find very detailed information on the year 2021. I will not focus in my presentation on the data of 2021. So if you have time, of course, you can download the whole report and look at it in more detail. So this is how the Solar Heat Worldwide report looks like. So this is just the, the cover page. And here you see the solar thermal capacity in operation, so the accumulated installed capacity and the accumulated installed capacity uh, is 542 gigawatt installed capacity uh, corresponding to 774 million square meter of collector area this includes flat blade collectors eventually tube collectors and air collectors so it's all collectors uh, included the annual energy yield of these systems installed is 442 terawatt hours which correlates also to, to savings of close to 50 million tons of oil or uh, 150 million tons of co2 annually so it's a quite significant contribution also uh, for reducing the co2 emissions in total this represents 115 million solar thermal systems installed worldwide. But I should mention here, I guess solar heating uh, is the only sector which really takes li the lifetime of systems into account. So we deduct old systems again, and just in comparison to PV or wind, at least to my knowledge, we are the only ones who deduct the old systems. Um, so these systems I, I presented just now, uh, the systems are really in operation. Uh, the annual installed capacity and net additions you can see on, on this slide. And as you can see, uh, starting with 2012, 2013, uh, the annual installations unfortunately, unfortunately went down. And we had an increase again uh, from 2020, 2021. And as it looks as a first uh, look, uh, in general, there is uh, we had a, a quite good market growth, particularly in Europe. Uh, but uh, as you might also know, if you are from the sector, uh, we have two or one really dominating market, which, which is China. And China, uh, unfortunately, had a significantly decrease, and also India last year therefore the worldwide market decreased by 9.3 percent in the last year but as i just mentioned the decline is justified by market slump in china of 12.4 percent and india so really a significant drop drop uh, from 16 percent growth last year to minus 21 percent in 2022 so this is basically why we have a worldwide trend going down but if you look on the major markets in Europe, we have a significant growth. We had a significant growth last year. I will start with Lebanon, even if Lebanon is not one of the major markets of Europe, of course, or worldwide. But nevertheless, you can see they had a really a growth of 145%. I don't want to go in much detail, but they had also a change in policy, and therefore it had a significant growth. Uh, of this uh, range. But also, if you look to European countries, 
We had an increase of the market in 2022 of 43% in Italy, France 29%, Greece 17%, Poland 11%, Germany 11%, and also South Africa. So these are the yellow arrows now, they were the European countries, but also here with 9%, South Africa had a significant growth with 9% and 5% in Cyprus and the United States. Just this is based on this uh, preliminary, preliminary data based on uh, the, the data we received. We have not yet uh, received all countries here. So if there's some, but it looks quite good for European countries. And as I said, worldwide, it's basically the impact of China and India that it went down. Uh, large scale solar thermal heating systems play a major role. Uh, for years already. And you can see here the development of these large scale systems. Uh, and this includes not only solar district heating, but also other large scale systems, uh, which are bigger than 500 square meter installation or 350 kilowatt. And as you can see here from this slide on the long term, uh, this was really for, for years, this was the large scale systems. Uh, were dominated especially by Europe or European countries. And in 2019, China took over the lead in terms of the number of large scale systems installed per year. You can see this in the bars uh, and China is indicated here in orange and the European uh, systems are in, in green. So this is a significant change and this is uh, ongoing. Up to now, by the end of 2022, we have 571 large scale systems we have documented, which is an equivalent of 2.1 gigawatt installed capacity, which is corresponding to 3.1 million square meter of collector area. A specific part of these large scale systems are solar district heating systems. And as you can see on this uh, figure, Denmark is leading in terms of uh, number of systems and also the size of systems. So this bar really goes to the second floor. So it's cut on the top. Uh, Denmark alone has an installed capacity of 1.1 gigawatt with about 123 systems installed. But then number two is China with 67 systems. Then you have Germany, Austria, other European countries, Saudi Arabia, and so forth. But the top three are Denmark, China, and Germany. In total, uh, we have detailed information of 325 solar district heating systems with 1.8 gigawatt uh, installed capacity. A highlight in the year 20, uh, 2022, sorry for the typo here, it's not 2020. Uh, it was 2022. Uh, China reported the installation of 170,000 collect square meter of collect area in district heating systems and other 25 large scale systems with an average of close to 7,000 square meters per plant. And in Germany, eight systems for solar district heating were installed with a total collector area of 44,000 or close to 45,000 square meter. And this is interesting. Uh, in Germany, there are about 90, uh, sorry, 50 systems uh, installed already. Uh, and uh, this was really, uh, 2022 was a record year for solar district heating in Germany. It's not just these eight systems newly installed, but also nine systems in a very advanced stage of uh, some of them already uh, under construction and advanced planning stage. And in preparation, there are about 66 six systems with a total collector area of 450,000 square meters. So it looks optimistic for the, for the future, for the upcoming years. Uh, this is just one of the solar district heating plants in Germany, in Lemgo. It consists of 9,000 square meter vacuum tube collectors. Uh, it's just to show one of the nice pictures of these large scale systems here for district heating in Germany. 
chip systems. I will not go very much in detail on solar heat for industrial processes because Bärbel uh, will focus more on, on the chip systems. Um, we have in our database, we have now close to 1,100 chip systems. It's about 1.2 million square meter of collector area. So it's about 856 megawatt uh, op in operation worldwide. I want to mention here that uh, with district heating, we think we have really covered all the district heating systems worldwide because they are known in the country. So it, it's re relatively easy uh, to get them into our statistics and get the information. The ship systems is significantly harder to really collect worldwide all the systems. Um, for instance, China always reports a number of systems, but we don't get detailed uh, data for this system. So at least, therefore, at least 1,100 systems, most probably there are uh, quite a number more of these systems in operation. We just don't have in our statistics. Uh, out of this, uh, 1,100 systems we have for close to 500 systems. We have detailed information available in our uh, database, uh, which we are running here at AINTEC in our institute. You have the link here. So if you're interested on the detailed information of this on the ship systems, you just follow this link here, shipplants.info, and then you know where the applications are how big the systems are in which countries. So you get a lot of information here on this close to 500 systems. And it is to get a good overview on the size of the collector types which are used um, and on the sectors where they applied. Just one picture of the systems installed in 2022. In 22, at least 114 new plants were installed. Uh, Bärbel, Apple, uh, present more of this afterwards. And this is one of the systems installed uh, in the United States uh, in the last year. It's a uh, Bill uh, Ball Corporation headquarter in, headquartered in Fairfield in California in, US, in the US. They use flat plate collector with a 2.8 megawatt installed capacity. Uh, and this plant provides provides heat for washing beverage aluminum cans. It's just to give you one example of the many systems installed. Coming to PVT, so photovoltaic thermal systems. This was really a success story in the last years. Uh, so about 1.5 million square meters of PVT collectors are installed worldwide. So this is what we have accumulated. And if you look on the PVT markets up to now, then you can see this combination of producing heat and electricity in one collector unit is really mainly in Europe with 62%, then Asia without China, 21%, so a lot of is done in Asia here, and uh, China accounts for 10% of the installed capacity. Then we have the MENA region, so Middle East and North Africa, about 4%, and others 3%. If you look to Europe, France is by far dominating the European market. It's 40% of the market, followed by Germany, 10%, the Netherlands, 7%. And we had a quite good increase of about 9% annually uh, until 2021. And unfortunately, in 2022, this really changed. Uh, the global PVT market shrank by 52%, and it's mainly due to two countries, and this is France. This, uh, so the biggest market uh, worldwide, this really collapsed the reduction of minus 90%, mainly due to changes in the subsidy scheme. This was one of the main uh, yeah, factors. Another factor was that a lot of these companies who produce PVT and also PV alone, they had such a big demand that they mainly focused on the PV production instead of, instead of PVT. Uh, we had also a significant reduction of the market in the Netherlands with 43%, but also very positive uh, market developments. I have to mention with smaller uh, markets like in Italy, 
four, uh, yeah, four times the market compared to 2021. So 414%, Germany 126%, Switzerland plus 103%, and Spain is plus 52%. So we have a very mixed market development here. And I want to show just one final slide to PVD collectors. If you look to 2021 on the left-hand side on this bar, then you can see uh, here that we had in 2022, the market changed completely. So in 2021, PVD air collectors were 45% of the total market. And this PVD air collector uh, disappeared completely from the market in 2022. And this is mainly the impact of France, where they had this change in, in the subsidy scheme and the air PVD systems really disappeared from the market last year. Quickly, an outlook to 2023 or the current year and beyond. There's really a very good outlook very positive outlook on solar thermal heating and cooling there's really we can see an increased demand in solar district heating so it's not in just one country what we had years ago in denmark there was a booming market and in up the other countries uh, came up step by step now we have an increased demand in solar district heating in number of countries and in my point of view this is a very cost effective way to make urban district heating systems CO2 neutral. And we have shown already in, in large scale systems like in Denmark, then this heat can be produced for cost of 20 to 50 euro per megawatt hour. And this is really where solar heat is really competitive compared to gas or other or coal fired district heating plants. And just as a remark, uh, even if there's a lot of discussion of electrifying the heat sector, this will not be done by just electrifying uh, the heat sector in using renewable, hopefully renewable electricity and heat pumps. As you know, 50% of the final energy demand is still, and this did not change over the last 15 years, 50% is heating and cooling. And this will not be done in the next decade is just electrifying the heating sector. So there's a huge potential for solar district heating, and this can be seen now in an in increased uh, demand. Uh, so there is in the pipeline, what we know it's uh, solar district heating for the next years in the range of 400 to 500 megawatt. Uh, just mention a few of them. In Germany, nine solar district heating systems as a mentioned already before, are under construction or in the advanced planning stage, another 66 are under concrete discussion. In the Netherlands, a large scale system is 48,000 square meters, so 33 megawatt uh, in the stage of uh, completion, more or less in Groningen. Then also in the West, Western Balkan countries, in Serbia and Kosovo, there are big plants, as you can see here, with 58,000 square meters and four and the 408,000 cubic meter seasonal storage uh, in an advanced stage already in, for district heating system in Pristina, capital city of Kosovo, and another two district heating plants are planned for Serbia, but also large scale systems, 24 megawatt, uh, so in the other one even bigger. There's also a new dimension uh, is opening up in China, the Handan Bay water, uh, world resort. It's uh, all nearly finished in the construction. It's a 114,000 square meter uh, parabolic trough collector system. So close to 80 megawatt uh, system uh, is uh, is under construction or nearly complete. Uh, also, there's a very positive outlook for ship plants. Um, Pebble will mention more out of this, and it's also information of Bear Lab. So um, there are planned for 2023 about a sevenfold increase uh, of the plants installed. 
So that's really positive outlook. And I'm coming to my last slide. Uh, if you want to know more about the solar heat worldwide report, uh, we're happy if you download it from our website. So from the IEA solar heating and cooling programs website, you can download uh, the report. And there is, of course, more, much more detailed information compared to what I could present now in this short time. Um, and you are interested in also the older editions. So want to go back in history. As I said, this is the 19th edition already of the Solar Heat World Ride Report. With this, I thank you for your attention and hand over back to Pedro. Thank you very much, Werner. So um, Werner provided us an overview of the evolutions in the different segments. Um, yeah, such as large scale systems um, and also uh, the main segment, the, the residential, including new solutions, as PVT. Um, as, as we've seen, there was an interesting evolution regarding uh, large scale, so district heating and, and solar heater industrial processes. Um, but as, as Vernon mentioned, he didn't get into more details because the latter one, the, the, the ship systems, so for industry, uh, will be uh, covered in, in the next presentations. And with this, uh, I would like to go to our next speaker, Berber Lepp, uh, which uh, who, whom is a extremely well-known journalist uh, covering uh, solar thermal for over uh, 20 years. Uh, she's the founder and managing director of the agency Sol Rico and the editor of solarthermalworld.org, which I believe uh, most of you will, will know well. Um, and Berber has also been an author and collaborator in many relevant publications, such as the solid and cooling uh, marketing industry, industry section in the RAIN 21 Global Status Reports. Um, so it's it's um, very interesting to to have Barbara with us because she's been developing um, a good network also uh, for uh, large scale systems and 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 ship in particular. Um, so these adding to all the experience she has in, in the sector. Uh, and I'm sure that once again, she will give us a very good uh, and very interesting perspective on the global industrial solar heat markets. Um, so uh, the floor is yours, Mary. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pietro. Nice introduction. I would like to start my presentation here. I hope this works. I would like to talk today about global industrial solar heat market challenges, trends, and outlook. This uh, survey, well, the, the presentation is based on annual surveys that we did since 2017 and on a regular basis. The last two surveys were financed by the German research uh, project Modulus. I would like to send a big thank you to them and also to Vara Latvidat. She did the survey with me and followed up with the companies. We have established a ship supplier world map where you find the link here below and the companies which are on this world map receive a questionnaire once a year and from this we generate what you will see today. Yeah, the ship market has developed dynamically again after COVID. This is what Werner already said. We had uh, 400, 114 systems identified in 2022. This was the highest number we ever had, but you also see the obvious slowdown due to COVID restriction of traveling and also transportation cost hesitating of clients. Uh, we had a certain, um, you know, slowdown in the market a lot in the years 2020, 2021. We see a big diversification of the ship system. Um, this chart shows you the overall new ship capacity that was installed in 2020, which is 30 megawatt in total. And you see that a lot of different collector types were used for the project that we identified. So this goes from the very low temperatures, unglazed polymer collectors, PVT collectors, air, to the very high temperatures where you have parabolic drafts, which you can produce 250 to 300 degree or um, concentrating dish or linear flannel. So this is a big trend that we see. Altogether, we had um, seven ship plants among the 114 with operating temperatures above 100 degree in last year's market. 
So this shows you just an overview what collector types we have and what temperature levels they serve. And uh, you see here in the middle column the different processes in the industry that need these different temperature levels. So you see from the previous pie chart I showed you that from the very 60 degree to the 400 degree projects um, we have served a lot and we have served also a lot of these different processes. Current and future driving factors. I have listed you some important ones from my point of view. Well, the first one was obviously the gas shortage in Europe and the peaking energy prices in 2020, which woke up a lot of the industry uh, people. We have also good funding situation in some European markets, to name here is Austria, France, Netherlands, Germany and Spain, but also the United States are coming up. I would like to mention Austria here particularly because they have started a subsidy program um, two years ago where they also grant visibility studies above with for projects above 5000 square meters and this had a big success in the meantime we have 13 visibility studies in their pipeline and the average of the ship systems is 15 megawatt and if you compare this to the only three ship plants that we have in operation in europe at the moment which range between 7 and 11 megawatt this is a huge success you, we will also probably hear more about the US, not only because the supply chain for ship systems increased a lot, I will come to this point later in the US, but also they have um, allocated again a big budget for ship systems, so not only ship but renewable heat in general, um, of 4 billion US dollars, again tax credits which were in place already previously. And uh, we will talk to the um, project developers there to find out the effects that will have. This is a very new information, I think, still from May. Also, an important driver of a ship uh, demand is uh, the internal commitments of multinational corporations to reduce their carbon footprint. The company brand names that you find in, in brackets here, like Heineken, Asahi, Carlsberg, Meyer Mellenhof, PepsiCo or Boltmold, these are multinational corporations that run sometimes above 50 factories uh, around the world. And they have done already or they are about to realize the first ship plans for their factories. So if this is successful and they will be satisfied with their, um, you know, with the yields and uh, the performance of the systems, we are pretty sure that there will be more systems coming up within their within their factories. The emission trading system and um, saving carbon pricing um, in national, on the national level is an important driver and some uh, you know, of the project developers already price this into their ship systems as a saving, which helps them to, for the economy of their system. And a very new factor that will probably also have a big effect is the European supply chain due diligence law. Uh, which just came into force in January 2023 and that requires EU companies to carefully manage social and environmental impacts along their entire value chain, including direct and indirect suppliers. So there's a big pressure coming from the EU now to really green and uh, decarbonize also the heat structure and solar thermal would be a good solution for that. But well, good prospection, a lot of factors of driving the market, but um, still uh, the mood on the ship market 2022 was sort of divided. The companies, about 80%, confirmed that there was a triggered demand by the energy prices. Also, they confirmed that public financial support, which is the second part here, is still an important requirement for selling ship. This was also confirmed by around 80%. But um, the high interest was still linked to low decision making. So the industry is still reluctant and still hesitating. And as soon as something new is happening, gas prices go down or uh, they have another plan, you know, they step back from plans and so on. So altogether, only 22% of the 72 ship turnkey suppliers that are listed on the world map were actually satisfied with the business development in 2022. Some highlights from the year 2023. 
Um, I would like to show you this photo as it is the first fee fabricated balance of plan for an oil and oil concentrating solar field in Turnout, Belgium that Werner already mentioned. It's a system that produces 300 degree steam for a um, chemical factory and um, this is a good way forward to save costs and to have a very you know like a cost effective way of, of producing this part between the collector field and the client. Another uh, maybe milestone was this large dish um, developed by an Australian company, Sunray CSP, built up in India with 450 square meters. It's a double tracked system producing direct steam uh, at fairly high efficiencies, has a reasonable small you know, ground to foot print. And um, well, let's see whether they succeed to get more of these installed um, in the near future. And um, another milestone is the big plant that we have seen um, under construction in Spain for the Heineken factory in Sevilla. It's an ESCO project uh, which NG, the utility, um, uh, the Spanish uh, subsidiary of the utility NG, will be provide the heat. The solar field is um, installed by Aztec. It cons consists of, uh, you know, parabolics, which the size of CSP plants in the original size, and it will de deliver 210 degree uh, to the factory of uh, Sevilla. And it must be installed in a record short time because the subsidies uh, force the project developers to finish by September. Uh, and New Heat will talk about their milestone themselves, I suppose, Nicolas. Um, they have just uh, about to commission this uh, 10.5 megawatt plant in France, uh, which he will probably explain us in detail on his presentation. So what was special this year for the first time in our survey is that we wanted to have this crystal ball. We wanted to see what the future brings in terms of ship. And we had a bit of funding from the National Resources Canada. A big thank uh, to them on this point. So we have asked the project developers to give us not only their 2022 projects, but also contracted projects and projects under development. And 21 project developers from around the world followed this request and thank, a big thank to them, you know, against NDAs and sometimes, you know, like their major leads and whatever, they gave us the information, also some detailed information about the projects they plan. So we have them from Austria, Belgium, Canada, France, Germany, India, Israel, Mexico, Netherlands, Spain, Sweden, Switzerland and USA. This was where the companies came from. And they reported altogether 51 projects that are upcoming, you know. And um, we looked into the methodology that Solitas used. And Solitas was behind the German map that Werner Weiss showed in his presentation on solar district heating. And what they do is if they get projects in an early planning stage, they give them a realization potential. So if, for example, that's how we translated this into ship, into the ship market, if only a signed LOE or MOU is available for a project, we consider the capacity of this project only a 30% into our forecast. If an engineering study is already ordered by the client or uh, the proved uh, subsidy of the financing is available, then we consider this a 60% realization chance. And if an EPC contract for delivering the collector field or heat delivery contract is signed or construction already started or first heat was already delivered to the client, these are obviously a secured project and we consider them 100%. So this is a harmonized approach that we um, developed together with Soditess and they are using it for the map and we are now using it for the outlook. But before you can do your outlook, you have to look where you come from. And this is now the ship market as you know, as uh, it developed from 2016 to 2020. It's cumulated figures in megawatt. Um, the number of systems which were installed in each of these years are the gray dots um, on the top, you know. So we started in 2016 identifying the market in a very comprehensive survey among industry players, also harmonizing that with the ship minus plant.info database that Werner mentioned. So this was our world market sort of status quo at this point. And from there on, we added what we researched every year. This is the yellow bars. 
um, which is not so much as you see, it was always between 18 and, and 28 megawatt. It's also without China. I think uh, Werner already said that China is very hard to research and we always have difficulties to confirm data from there. So we excluded all projects from China in this, even in the outlook. And um, I have to explain what the light um, um, purple fields here are. This is the capacity additions in the two phases of the ship plant in Oman and in, in from Glass Point. It was one time 120 and one time in 2019, 180 megawatt. So this helped us a lot to big, the, make these big jumps in the ship overall capacity. But unfortunately, in May 2020, Glass Point was uh, going bankruptcy and um, this flow of projects was interrupted and they, they are now in 2020 uh, refounded and we will see parts of it. Their announced projects is part of our outlook. So how does this outlook look like now? We have identified the 51 projects and 25 of them are fairly committed already to be finalized in 2023 and they add up to 71 megawatt. So this is already a nice increase compared to the 23 um, uh, megawatt that were added in 2022. And now if you go a step further and you look into projects that are announced for the years 2024 and 2026 and you do this weighted uh, you know, a strategy from Solitas by only counting 30-60% of the projects, we end up with 304 megawatt that will be, that are already announced at this early stage for the next years to come. So I think the ship market really has a good uh, potential for growth. If we are very optimistic on, you know, what will, uh, how real reliable the data is and whether all projects will be realized, then we will even reach an another doubling. So this column here with the 1.695 megawatt, this is if all the projects without reduction and weighted, you know, percentage probabilities come true. So you see that we had the first big jump because of um, Oman project, a doubling in capacity until 2019, and we would then reach again a doubling in a, in a shorter period of only several years. So altogether good outlooks. Um, two interesting figures, figures or factors, if you look into the ship market, usually is the share of concentrating collectors, and it, which is here in yellow and red, and uh, the share of ESCO projects. So I have pointed first to you the history again, 2021 and 2022, according to the newly installed ship capacity of these two years. You saw that, you see in the top that the concentrating collectors have about 20% um, share of the newly installed capacity. In the bottom line, you see that heat, uh, the ESCO model, which we call heat uh, delivery contracts, you know, is um, sometimes a bit higher because 2021, a big uh, new heat project came online. So this was uh, a bigger share. But in 2022, again, the share was rather small. And now I show you what our outlook says about these two factors. And you see that the concentrating collectors will increase a lot. So among the 51 projects that we have received, a very high share is concentrating collectors. So the share will go up to 70 and 80 percent. Same thing on the ESCO side. So from the very small shares where we come from, we will reach um, at the 2023 projected project, 78 percent of the in, um, introduced capacity will be in ESCO model. And um, further on, um, 2024 onwards, it will be even uh, 94 percent. So from this, you can really see that at the moment, the market looks like everybody who is going big in ship, you know, is doing ESCO business model and a lot of them use concentrating collectors. A last little crystal ball, you know, if you look now into where the 51 projects are located, you see that um, Europe plays a big role, including Turkey here with 150 megawatt, equally strong with the Arabic uh, countries where big projects were announced. India and Mexico have a lot of projects, but smaller ones, as you can see from their share here. And USA already um, with a certain pie chart, which we probably see more growth here as well. So um, only my time is uh, flying, but only uh, um, let me confirm you um, by looking into the ship supply side, because we have talked now a lot about the demand side. 
that also the supplier side, which is our world map, you know, of ship suppliers, reflect the trends that I have just talked about. This shows you the portfolio of the 72 turnkey ship suppliers which are on the world map at the moment. And um, you see that uh, the larger share of these uh, companies have, uh, para have uh, concentrating collectors in the meantime. So we have seen a growing uh, field of parabolic draft collectors, which are now already at 17. We have a growing concentrating dish provider field. And um, so this, this shows already that uh, there is more innovation and startups coming up also in this field. Regarding ESCO, um, I can balance now that 65% of all the companies listed on the world map offer ESCO services, which is also an increasing uh, share over the years. This is the ranking of the turnkey ship suppliers related to the ship project they reported to us over the years in the surveys by the end of 2020. The top positions, Modulo Solar, um, Sunrain Group, Solar East Group, uh, the new paradigma remained the same. But um, in the, within the ranking, there were some changes because mainly the Netherlands companies, G2 Energy and Next Source, climbed up in the ranking because they have a nice subsidy program, which is called SDE++, and they do a lot of agricultural systems, which also count like ship. And we had uh, two, um, and we had uh, Tiki from Israel starting into the ranking with their 10th uh, system this year. And we lost Megawatt, uh, the only Indian manufacturer which was still left in the ranking because they have other priorities now and they are not that much anymore in ship. Yeah, this is where the companies come from that are listed on the world map. This is my last chart. You see that Mexico is still a big hub for the industry. But USA and Canada, these are the two brown marked um, pie charts here with eight and three companies are rising. So we have seen, um, I think, six new entries from this uh, region from both countries um, this year. So there's really an increasing supply chain. And you also see that the countries with the nice subsidy programs in Germany, Austria, Spain, Netherlands, Germany and France are well re represented in this um, industry circle. So this was it from my side. Um, this is for your records afterwards to read more. You know, I have listed you the major um, sources of information. You find under this first link, uh, Modulus, all the reports about our recent uh, ship surveys. Um, you find uh, the list, the, the world map itself under solar-payback.com suppliers. We have a photo database I wanted to remind you on with uh, around 100 photos of ship plants, which are um, suitable to be used. You can download them and if you give the reference of the copyright donor, you can use them for free in your presentations or publications. And then uh, all the different sources here, like you can follow us on Twitter or LinkedIn. And if you have further questions and comments, don't hesitate to contact me via app.sobico.com. So this is it from my side. I'm looking forward to the Q&A session and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Berbel. Um, Thanks for the, 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 this outstanding insight in the current trends and, and driving factors for ship. Uh, I, I have to say that living in Belgium, I really like to see the examples, uh, like the one you, you, you have shown, as uh, it really, people think that uh, we don't have enough solar energy in this country to use uh, uh, solar thermal. And, and the, the example you, you were giving is one of the, uh, not the only one, but one of the interesting ones uh, where uh, it's already used for industry and for higher temperature. Um, as we've seen, the solar in industrial heat outlook is, was quite impressive. Um, I, I point out the potential doubling of the capacity from 2019 to 2023. Uh, and I think we can also understand a bit better um, with the next presentation. And uh, I'm, I'm happy to introduce uh, uh, Nicolas Gravelin, uh, Nicola is a, a, a more recent newcomer to our sector. Uh, he has an excellent experience in water treatment in different countries and different continents. Um, even if joining our sector in, in 2021, uh, uh, Nicola already has an extremely interesting experience as head of international development uh, um, at New Heat. Um, New Heat is a project developer. We're happy also to have them as a a member of Solid Europe, uh, and, and they have been pivotal uh, in the development of large-scale solar heat uh, in Europe, namely for, for industrial processes. Um, therefore, um, it's clear that Nikolai is, is 
extremely well positioned to to tell us uh, more about uh, um, the experience of solar heat in, in, in this context. So, Nicola, please, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Pedro. Um, let me just manage this little technical issue to share my screen. And I hope you can see it well online. If I don't hear anything, I suppose it's you hear it. Pedro, we can, can see, you we can see, but to the but not the main uh, um, screen. So we can see the the one where you, you with the with the support of the slideshow. Okay. If you go to display settings. Sorry, it just worked before and now. Um, if we start again, uh, your screen sharing, maybe that's the way to, to get it. Arabella, if you can give me the control as we did before. Yes, one second. Here we go. No, I don't. Um, okay, well, while you prepare that, so we already have received some questions on the on the uh, on the question panel. So um, we invite you to 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 use it for additional questions you might have. We will address them after the, um, all the presentations um, are are done. Um, some of them uh, there is already some information on the on the question panel. But we will uh, come back to to some of these questions also uh, later on. So, okay, uh, Nicola. So, uh, please, uh, we can see the the main screen. So, please go ahead. All right. Thank you. Um, yeah. So, thanks. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Pedro, and uh, thank you, uh, Werner Weiss, for the invitation to uh, to be here today at this uh, Solar Academy. Uh, the purpose of my um, my presentation today is mainly to present what we have so far in operation. So we're not talking about a prospective pipeline or a uh, hypo uh, hypothetical uh, project. We will focus today on the projects which are currently in operation under a heat purchase agreement in the industry. For that, I would like to give a little introduction about who we are very quickly, um, as I believe our business model is quite linked to the success factor of these projects and uh, so that they play a key role in the fact that these projects have come to life. So very quickly, um, we are at New Heat, we are 100% renewable heat provider. Um, we are leader in the solar thermal for industrial solar in Europe. Um, and uh, even though solar thermal is in our DNA, we quickly added a few other equipment and technological bricks, such as heat pump, heat recovery being the first one you look at when you look on an industrial site. And of course, once you have solar thermal heat recovery heat pumps, they need to be combined in a short or long-term heat storage to be able to adapt production and demand. How we do it, that's our model on the left. We provide a design, build, own, and operate model. So at New Heat, we have engineers which design it up front. They do the preliminary studies uh, and then the detailed studies. Um, we have then the development phase. We build our projects and we finance them also ourselves. And then we usually operate them for 15, 20, 25 years. Um, what we do for industrial clients is really to understand first the heat requirements. Uh, it's key. We're not just a producer of heat, we produce and integrate directly in the process of the client. So it needs a bit of effort, a bit of monetization capacity to ensure that what the client gives us is also what we will uh, provide heat to. Uh, and then, of course, in-house, we design the different uh, requirements and propose a solution. It's really a project-by-project -project approach, so there's no 
one size fits all. Um, yes, we could say it's a square for a thermal field with a storage tank, but yes, then there's all the part on the other side where it's really tailor-made to adapt to the heat requirements uh, of the client. So one of the key aspects and one of the key uh, success factor of a ship and large scale ship is the capacity to provide heat as a service. So um, in this solar thermal today, when you combine it with renewable, uh, other renewable heat, solar storage, uh, thermal storage, heat pumps, heat recovery, are typically seven, 10 years payback. And so you don't find a lot of industrial clients which are happy to invest on such long-term return on investment. So we take the risk in-house, we take the technical risk, the financial risk, and the administrative risk for all the development, the permitting, and so on. And the idea is, against that, we request a commitment from the heat consumer for 15 or 25 years. Very quickly, we are based uh, today uh, mainly in Bordeaux, with 40 people, uh, 40 of us here in, uh, in UIT, engineering, modeling, uh, construction, and operation on top of business development. And uh, we have an office in uh, Madrid to develop the Spanish and Portuguese markets. We have uh, a colleague based in Graz for all the district heating networks for the Central Eastern Europe. And then we have two more tropical uh, destinations with Sydney, uh, with Francois Xavier and Chile with Gustavo, who are both working on this very sunny country with stable economic growth. So now I'd like to dive into the, the processes, the solar heat in the ship plants uh, for uh, different clients that are currently running, that can be um, today uh, inspected or visited uh, if you would like to, and where we, when we have uh, the performance, we can show the performance over 12 or 24 months, depending on the, uh, on the plant or even longer for the first with uh, Conda. So overall, uh, new heat today, we have more than 40 megawatts of renewable heat plants in operation. Today, I'd like to focus only on those which are solar heat for industrial plants. So we also work with uh, district heating networks, but it's not the topic today. So um, if you look at these three projects, uh, Conda was, uh, was our first project uh, for the company Lecta, which is uh, a paper manufacturing company. Um, then we have a plant in a, that we operate in Isoudan uh, for an investor, which is Qtherm, and the client, which is Bortmalt, which we operate uh, daily, and um, which is an interesting project. And then finally, since uh, last November, we operate the largest plant on that plate crater in Europe with the lactoserum uh, powder factory of Lactalis in Verdun, north of France. Um, I think it's important to see that each time these projects are very specific and they change from one to the other. Um, the first one, uh, which was commissioned in 2019, was, a, was from the Conda paper mill from the Lecta group. Uh, we have a peak power of 3.4 megawatt thermal. Uh, with a little storage capacity and the, um, the capacity to avoid 1,000 tons of CO2 per year. It was our first project, quite a complicated one, because we had to rehab rehabilitate an old carbonated sludge uh, storage area. So under the panels, you actually have a, an old uh, car sludge uh, deposit that we had to uh, insulate and uh, uh, impermeabilize. Um, and there, the role of the plant is to preheat the makeup boiler, uh, the makeup water for the boiler. The, and on the financing part or subsidies, it was a subsidy, a grant of above 50% granted by the French energy agency ADEM, uh, and with one specific client, the Conda Paper Mill. Um, then the second project um, that, uh, that I want to present today was commissioned in April 2021. Uh, so we have now two years of, uh, of visibility. 
uh, two years of fine tuning and two years of operating in parallel with the biomass, biomass and with the cogeneration plant. So for those who have an idea of how to run multiple heat production at the same time, you understand the complexity. And so we're quite proud of achieving the daily operation of this plant in a complex environment. Uh, here, the, um, the size of the plant is about 12 megawatts. Uh, we run a storage capacity of 3,000 cubic meters, and we avoid 2,000 tons per year of um, CO2. Again, the, the, the French ADEM was um, one of the, of the grants that was received for that. Um, and it's one of the only projects today where we had a third party investor, Qterm. And so we, it's a plant that we don't own and uh, that we have built, that we have designed uh, with our engineering team and that we operate since. I think it's also interesting to see that it's split in three areas. It's because the area uh, was a bit uh, crowded and the land we could gather uh, was a bit uh, uh, split in, in uh, was small and uh, a bit confined. And finally, the latest project, I'd like to go a bit uh, to, uh, to give you a bit more details around um, what, we, what we've made there. So this is really the latest, uh, it's our latest uh, child, if we can say. Um, it's uh, providing heat to uh, uh, milk drying uh, tower for lactalis. Uh, and it's a group which is in on this on this site, the Lactoserum France uh, site. They produce mainly um, uh, whey powder, and uh, here we we are we are using solar thermal and storage to uh, preheat this. Um, this heat in the tower directly and inject hot air into the very uh, exigent and critical process which is uh, this uh, this tower this drying tower as you might know they're very strict on um, hygiene and uh, what you get because half of this uh, product end up in baby milks or in uh, in other food additives so this is a this is the largest project uh, that we know of, maybe Barbell in your uh, uh, database, you have others, but in Europe, we believe it is the largest uh, plant uh, for industrial application in operation currently. There could be some we hear in the coming uh, uh, year that, uh, that, might, uh, that might dwarf this project, but um, it's still a very good uh, uh, a reference we are very proud of. Uh, and so with two applications, 13.3 megawatt distributed mainly for main air inlet drying, but also to regenerate the de dehumidification cartridges. Um, this project has, was interesting in terms of um, structuring for the finance aspect. Uh, the French agency also with the French Chaleur has provided a, a grant, but uh, there was also a fund available for um, industrial development in the region, which chipped in and which, kept, which joined in the SPV as a co-shareholder of the, um, of the plant. And the, the duration of this plant is, of this uh, contract is for 25 years. One of the project highlights was the integration of our air to water exchanger into their process uh, some of you might know, but uh, the people which are doing these drying towers for milk uh, are very critic on what you add or what you change into this process. And so we had to work hand in hand, our engineers with uh, uh, drying tower engineers to make sure that we comply with their specification. And so we had to integrate in their uh, airflow in front of the steam air heat exchanger our own air water heat exchanger to benefit from the lower temperature that could be provided by um, the solar thermal plant. Um, and finally, the key outtakes, there's a lot here, I realize when I see it again, <laughs> but um, so we today have sheep which are grazing, so that's the picture down there. And uh, they are even though it's a, 
it was built um, last year. The grass is there, very generous. So there's plenty to eat for, the, for our nice little uh, friend there. Um, there was also a lot of uh, concern around an, uh, a species, a dangerous frog species, which was identified by our environmental study. And so, of course, uh, the area was protected. Um, the site had archaeological interest, and so. Uh, the, uh, the state body, which is in charge of that, had to investigate and uh, recover some uh, archaeological uh, samples. And um, I think in terms of the technicality of the project, I would like to say it, that it, it looked like a very difficult project, but step by step, every hurdle was over, overcome. At first, we had to cross a railway between the solar plants and the factory. And so uh, this, this, can, this can add a bit of complexity in terms of uh, drilling under the railway, but also in terms of permanent, permanent access to this area because it's under the rail and you are in the property of the French railway authority. There is ATEX regulation because there is some, uh, some uh, powder uh, that can be in the air, so requirements around uh, explosive area. And of course, just to facilitate it, there is a high voltage transmission line above the solar field. And so that's uh, that's about it. Um, I think it's a it was a it's a very interesting project. Um, we still don't have enough uh, background to <laughs> to say the client is happy, but up to date, uh, it's working fine. It's providing heat to decarbonate up to 20% of the heat requirement of this um, of this uh, site. That's it from my side. Thank you. All right. Welcome, everybody. I think we are good to go for the Q&A session. I'm going to immediately hand you guys over to our moderator of the day, Pedro Diaz. And Pedro is going to take us through the Q&A question. If you have a question you want to submit, please use the chat box on your GoToWebinar panel. Type the question in and up, um, ideally also indicate who the question is for. Pedro, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Arvela, and uh, thank you all for, for joining us. So we are now uh, addressing the, um, some of your questions. Um, so we have the, the speakers with us uh, uh, live. Um, and uh, so we invite you, as Arvela was saying, to use the question pane uh, for any of the questions you might have. I would like to, to start with one of the questions for Werner which related to the temperature levels uh, that were referred in the report. So Berbal had an indication at the slide uh, with, uh, with the temperature levels, uh, with the example of, of applications for industry, but uh, those temperatures more or less apply to, to the rest. But maybe you can also provide more details, Vernon, on how we can also find references uh, um, within the report or how to see in the report uh, different types of systems and collectors and so on. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question, Pedro. So in general, <clears throat> we cover collectors from so all temperature levels, basically from ambient temperature. So uh, systems for swimming pool heating, where we basically work around the uh, ambient temperature. And it goes to solar water heating systems, where we usually work in the temperature range uh, between up to 60, 80 degrees, the same temperature level more or less we have for space heating systems, so solar combi systems, but also it's including cooling, FIP, uh, solar heat for industrial processes, where mentioned by Bärbel, the dif different temperature levels, and there we go up usually to about 250 degrees, because most of the uh, ship applications uh, and the maximum to 250, even if in the food and beverage industry, uh, also there, the maximum temperature required is usually around 100 degrees centigrade. So everything is included in this report and you find in the different sections more information on this, on the different applications. Okay, very good. Thank you very much, uh, um, uh, Werner. So the next question uh, is for Berbel, um, and this is about uh, 
the most common difficulties faced by the widespread of ship systems in the in the European market? I think Babel can't hear Pedro. Ah, okay. Um, but but Babel you could hear, hear me, Babel, So yes, Babel. I can hear Pedro. Yeah. So I think it's it's uh, the problem is with Babel. I believe okay, so. Okay. So I would. Okay. Uh, then I would go to um, to, to maybe uh, another question um, to to Nicola. Um, so we we had a, I'm, I'm combining a couple of questions, Nicola. Can you hear us, Nicola? Now I hear you again. Okay, uh, okay you hear Berber. So I go back to my, my previous. I go back to my previous question, Berber. So. Um, what uh, uh, are the, the most common difficulties faced by the widespread of ship systems in European markets? Ah, sorry for being shortly interrupted. Um, well, yeah, I think we have seen from Nicola's presentation that one big challenge is uh, that um, the, the systems are designed very individually. So they, the client is very important, the heat structure is very important. So the planning process is generally long, complex. And um, the industry is yet in a position where they hesitate uh, often and they see that this is a new technology. So there is too few demonstration plants available yet. So it's not that they see the, the dairy in the neighboring city or they have read in the news about that in their you know, neighboring whatever surrounding already a ship plant is in operation, but there are very few larger case studies. So there is a certain hesitation still and we need to speed up to get the demonstration plant uh, ready. And uh, I think the last issue which is usually uh, faced by project developers is the, the way that um, they look into very short payback periods. And um, solar thermal is an infrastructure uh, investment with a long-term look at, uh, long-term payment usually payback. And um, yeah, this is a bit of a conflict and we can only solve this by using the ESCO as, as a business model that was also stressed by Nicolas as one factor of success for their company. Pedro, we can't hear you anymore. Okay, sorry for that, my mistake. There we go. Yeah. Um, so next question to Nicolas. So Nicolas, also feel free to to comment on the on the previous uh, uh, question. But I uh, I have com I'm combining now two questions we have received. One um, is about what are the usual solar fractions of the of the, the of the projects, um, and uh, the other question is if there is any preferred backup system. Uh, that the industrial uh, clients prefer or ask for uh, in combination with uh, with solar thermal, and um, and if you have found any in, in, in these backup systems, they are usually based on fossil fuels or if they are solutions based on other renewable sources. Thanks. Thank you. Um, yeah, I would say one one of the difficulties that we can see today from the from the industrial markets is mainly due to the 48 months or yeah, 36 months we had previously where the high variability in price, uh, which can go very high, but also uh, people remember what the price was before the energy crisis. And so this, it's difficult for a decision maker in, a, in an industrial uh, site to decide whether a stable price fixed over 20 years will be better and competitive compared to other fossil fuels. And so if there is no um, strong strategy around decarbonation in the group or in the, on the site, and if there is no clear visibility on energy prices for the future, so if they don't have a strategy, it's often very hard for them to set the, the, the threshold where they want to invest their energy for the 15 or 20 coming years. Um, then you mentioned solar fraction, and this is really dependent on the temperature. Uh, of course, um, there is a there is an economical gap between if you run in low pressure, so up to 100, 120 degrees, or if you start running with vaporized water, um, and you start having seven to 20 bars, um, and then the economical is not the same. So I would say 
below um, below 100, 120 percent. Today, the soil fraction can be 100 percent. Uh, we are working on a malting plant in uh, Croatia on the development where it's 54 percent of the heat requirement. And should we have more space available to uh, to allow um, seasonal storage, we could have reached 100 percent with with um, with soil thermal and maybe four four five percent of uh, heat pumps to to reboost the temperature level in the long seasonal storage. So 100% is doable, and it really depends on where the where the t max temperature is set. And then um, on the preferred backup system, I would say usually it's a historical system. So if you do an upgrade, they typically keep the old system in place, and then it can be used as a backup. And then the question of fossil fuel or decarbonated fuel, of course, um, if it's it's what we usually see is natural gas boilers uh, a lot, and of course they they are a good backup. Typically, on a 100% solution, they should never be used. So it's a reliable solution with very limited carbonated impact if the solution is running, and very reliable to stop and start if there is a, an issue. Okay, thank you very much. So. Uh, I would then go to one question that I would place to to all of you, um, and this is related uh, to solar desalination uh, systems. So um, the question goes: um, uh, what, what are examples of projects of of, uh, of uh, freshwater uh, generation um, and um, and and if this and 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 what are the the technological requirements for for uh, the, such solutions? Um, my little experience in desalinization is only linked to uh, osmo uh, inverse osmosis, and then unfortunately it, it's linked with uh, um, electricity and high pressure in the pumps rather than uh, through through uh, heating. But um, unfortunately, I have personally we have no experience, or we were not uh, called, and we're happy to uh, to assess uh, whether uh, what technology could be the most suited for that. Maybe Werner or Berbel, you have uh, an experience with that. Well, I know that there are some uh, concentrating solar uh, concentrating uh, solar collector manufacturers like Rio Grass uh, concentrating on uh, developing uh, combinations of, of high source heat sources like from a concentrating collector with um, membrane distillation. So this is something, but they haven't really, I mean, they have done one or two demonstration plants, uh, but not more than that. And we could maybe refer to IASHC task 62 which is really looking at uh, you know like like waste heat recovery uh, waste waste um, water treatment sorry waste water mm -hmm. treatment from industry and um, they have looked into some wastewater plants and uh, finding solutions on that so there's some news on on the website of the task 62 yeah I just can add there are not many systems for this <coughs> seawater desalination desalination uh, running at all and most of the systems are rather old. So in recent years, no bigger system was built here. There's really, as it was mentioned by Nicolas, it's mainly uh, PV driven or electricity driven uh, reverse osmosis systems uh, running. And as Beverly mentioned, uh, this membrane distillation, there are some research projects going on, but no implementation in, in the market at the moment. At least to my knowledge. Okay, thank you very much. Then, um, also combining a couple of questions, um, I would like to ask if you uh, uh, what do you know about the use of PVT, so hybrid PV thermal collectors uh, or panels, um, for industrial uh, applications. And there is also um, a, a more specific question for Nicolas on. Uh, um, the, the, the on, on, on the request from the industrial sector to use PV for industrial process heating purposes. PV only, so PVT, general question, but then more specific 
on, on the use of PV for heating. So maybe I go for the PVT one. I think we have identified um, several PVT manufacturers and in, in the meantime in Europe which offer ship solutions. So this is really uh, picking up and they combine this often with heat pumps. So there is um, also different temperature levels available and even large scale projects um, of this type are under you know, development within Austria. This, this uh, program I talked about where visibility studies are also paid. So I think we, there's much more to be expected from this side and we will see a growing share of PVT systems um, among uh, the industrial heat plants in Europe. Um, yeah, I think I agree with you, Erbel. Um, the PVT will be developing and is developing already quite a lot on small scale uh, in installation. Um, we are today um, on all our projects assessing uh, the, the feasibility of using PVT uh, for the industrial clients uh, compared with flat plate collectors and parabolic troughs. Um, still, we see that in the range above 70 degrees up to 120, the flat plate collectors seem to be the most efficient solution. And if PV is required, it might be adding a few rows of PV on our uh, on our large scale uh, uh, flat plate collector fields. But I think it's also a market trend, and so the price needs to align. But also the the suppliers need to make sure that they are uh, they are happy to warranty both. The electrical output and the thermal output over uh, 10 years would be already quite something we, we would be happy to work with. And because of, of that, there might be some limitation uh, for large scale installation. Um, on, the, on the other side, uh, Pedro, you mentioned PV, PV plus heat production for industrial application. <clears throat> this has two benefits. So yes, um, and it, it really depends on on the market price and a few other issues that uh, if the network can be reliable. Um, we tend to say that close to the industry, we should keep all the, the land for thermal if it's available, because it's close by and you cannot pull pipes over longer distances. But if you have um, further distance, then you can install PV and have a PPA, plus locally have heat pumps or electrical boilers. <clears throat> Uh, and then it really depends on the of the ratio between your electrical costs and uh, the capacity to produce heat. So this this needs to be compared on a case by case uh, study. Uh, one thing that I would add is on the heat pump, uh, the the the, the uh, ancillary services that can be provided by heat pumps or electrical boiler are today a bit under evaluated in uh, in Europe. So not every market can benefit from that. But if you can electrify some of your process, then uh, Europe and uh, worldwide, there's some limitation. If you can electrify some of your process, you can call on demand when the electrical network is saturated and receive revenue or cheap electricity uh, in this uh, situation. And so cheap heat, which could make sense. <clears throat> okay, it. very good. Uh, Werner, just do, do you have something to add on the on this question on on the PVT uh, in particular on the PVT no, use? Not, not concerning if it's related to ship. I think it's it's well answered. The two colleagues, uh, as I mentioned in my presentation already, PVT had a constant growth until last year, when basically the the market in in France collapsed, and this is just related or yeah just related to air pvt systems but this is as i mentioned already uh related to a change in the subsidy scheme okay clear then that's all um for for uh, for today also so for this uh, q a session um i want to thank the the, the speakers for their uh, great presentations and uh, and also those of you attending the, the webinar uh, and, and, and also for the, the, the questions and the, the, these, these additional parts um, that, that help to, to get a bit more insight on, on, on the topic we're discussing today. Um, from my side, I also want to thank the IEA SOR Academy and IEA SHC and ISIS um, for this initiative and for their invitation. 
um, and, and looking forward for uh, future opportunities. So we also invite you to uh, download the, the reports, um, uh, the, the Solar Heat Worldwide Report that is now available on the IAHC uh, website. Um, and with this, it's all from, from, from our side. Uh, we hope you have enjoyed this uh, webinar and I will now pass on to Arabella for a final message. Thank you all and, and have a good day and a good summer. <laughs> Thank you very much, Pedro. Thank you, Beth, Nicola and Werner for joining us as speakers again this morning. And um, I only have a few short words from ISIS left for today. And the first thing is that um, for you, the attendees, there will be a recording of um, the webinar, as you saw it already, and also a recording of this Q&A session. And all those recordings, as well as the presentations given by the speakers, will be available in a few days on the IEA HSC Solar Academy homepage and also on the ISIS homepage. Last word from our side, from ISIS' side, we are going to have the ISIS Solar World Congress 2023 coming up this fall in, Oct in October and November in New Delhi, India. And I just wanted to share the news that we are going to open registration for that one very soon. So if you are looking to attend the event, stay tuned on the website, which is swc2023.org. And with that, it's my pleasure to close out the webinar for today. Thank you again to all the speakers for the moderation from Pedro and also to you, the attendees. Take care and, as Pedro said, enjoy the summer and or winter, depending on where exactly you are. But yeah, see you next time in September for the next IEA SSC Solar Academy webinar. Bye, everybody. Goodbye.